Hello, welcome to another video from the conscientious biologist Ben Gallagher. This is the fifth one in the evolution sequence and this one directly follows on from evolution four which looked at the theory of evolution by natural selection and this looks at the evidence that backs that theory up. It's from the GCSE specification and please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Thank you. So let's look at the fossil record. This is the piece of evidence that most people go to when we think about evolution. And it's a really, really good supporter of the theory. Now, please remember, we use theory in science slightly different to how it's used in day to day. A theory is something really quite irrefutable. It's when all of the evidence points in the same direction to the same interpretations, you know that theory is very, very sound. It's the same as gravitational theory. When you drop something, it falls down because of gravity. We all accept that, but gravitational theory is still uses that word theory, but it's what all the evidence suggests. So you know it, it's the most likely explanation, almost irrefutable. And when we look at the fossil record, we can look at creatures that have existed and we can try and sequence them. Now, this can only happen under specific circumstances. So when some organisms die in circumstances where their skeleton becomes buried in sediment, it can fossilize. Now, what we mean by that? is if you've got a creature that either lives in the sea, which is why we have so many fossils of trilobites and things like that that were aquatic creatures. But if something dies and it's by water, either dies by the edge of a river or a lake or the ocean or whatever, the water comes in, washes it out, it sinks, all its flesh rots off, and the skeleton then has all of the little tiny particles of, of uh, silt and rock and dust that's in the water settles down on top of it, compresses it, covers it in those basically tiny like rock powder is what the sediment is, compresses it and over millions of years um, the minerals that are in the rock move into the bone cells and turn the bones to rock. So fossils aren't bones, they were bones but they're now rock. Now what that means is millions and millions and millions of years, years later when the seabed or riverbed or whatever because of geological movement has been pushed upwards or oceans evaporated or whatever that rock is now finding itself on land those fossils can be dug up and extracted so fossils are the ancient remains of bones of creatures that have long since gone extinct now using isotopes in the rock of the fossils scientists can calculate the age of the fossil. Now this is from the chemistry curriculum, it also links up with physics. Isotopes are atoms with different amounts of nuclear, um, different amounts of uh, neutrons, uh, and you can look at those and look at the ratios between them and how quickly they degrade, and we know how long it takes that to happen, so if you look at the proportion of the different isotopes, you can age rock. You don't need to understand that for biology. All you need to understand is that there are methods for dating how old rock is. Now that means you can know how old the fossil is, which means you can know how long ago that organism lived. Now, if you know that, it means you can take those fossils, date them and literally line them up in age order. And you can observe the progressive improvements and changes. You can literally have a fossil there and you can date one and have it next to it and go, oh, well, yeah, there, there are, small observable differences there that that would only need to change a little bit to become this one and then you can date one to there and one to there and so on and you can line them all up that is evolution when you can see these tiny changes that are happening over time go back to the previous video if you can't remember the mechanism of directional selection but those tiny changes that you can see in the fossil record that is evolution so if we look at an example there we've got ancient fossils of ancient long since extinct fish we know those are older amphibians, so we know they line up in time. And you can put the fossils side by side and go, well, this very primitive amphibian, really it's just the front fins have turned into very primitive legs and it's dragged itself onto land. So you can kind of line them up. So we can say fish evolved, or some fish evolved into early amphibians and made their way onto land. Amphibians can have then evolved into reptiles by covering themselves in scales so they can move further away from water gaining teeth over time to um, catch more prey, increasing all their adaptations and spreading out by speciation into all the different types of reptiles. And reptiles, we think, pretty sure, evolved into birds or some reptiles evolved into birds. Now, while we can date the fossils and put them there, sometimes you come across fossils that confirm that by being a bit of a missing link. 
this is one of the world's most expensive fossils when it was bought. This was a fossil of a sort of part reptile, part bird dinosaur called Archaeopteryx. Now, if you look at the fossil, look on its arm structures there. Those are very, very clearly feathers sticking out. This was a kind of reptile bird hybrid. It literally fits there. You can see that yellow arrow. It fits in between reptiles and birds. As more and more fossils are found, we can fill in more of the gaps. However, the problem with the fossil record is, as we've said, not all organis organisms form fossils when they die. So there's massive gaps and you have to kind of get a fossil there, get one there that's like three million years later and go, well, we can kind of guess that maybe that one evolved into that one. But without all the little in between steps, very hard to use the fossil evidence, uh, fossil record as definite evidence. But more recently, we can use it for things like this. So these are all different hominid skulls, human like skulls going back through our ancestry. Now, these aren't technically fossils because they're not old enough to have formed bones, but it's the same principle. You can date the bones and you can line them up and age them and we can see human development. That's really what we're talking about with the fossil record, dating the, the fossils, lining them up, looking at how the evolution went from one to the next to the next. OK, next piece of evidence for evolution theory, and this one's really, really compelling. It's really strong evidence is anatomical comparison. Anatomical means looking at the anatomy, looking at the physiology of creatures and comparing them to see how close they are. So we're talking about homologous structures. The word homologous means same structure. Homo, homeo meaning same, logos meaning structure. Um, so it means the same structure, same locations of those. So in this instance, we're looking at structures that are virtually the same, but in totally, totally different creatures. This shows the existence of common ancestors, because if we've got a feature that's virtually identical to a creature that's very, very distant to us, then we probably both evolved that characteristic way back in time at our common ancestor, and then we became different like in the speciation slide on the last video that we saw. But we're going to look at an example of this, the pentadactyl limb. Pentadactyl means five-fingered limb, five-fingered arm, our arms, okay? So for a human, if we've got the diagram over there, the pentadactyl limb, you've got in purple at the top, you've got the humerus bone, this big upper arm one. You've got the radius and ulna, the bones here. You've got the metacarpals and carpals in the wrist and hand, and the phalange bones that are the fingers, okay? All of those bones are observable in a whale's flipper. Look at the comparison. Inside a whale's flipper, those are the front ones on the sides of a whale. If you dissected it, it's not like a fin on a shark that's just solid. It's got those bones in. It's got like a little arm inside the flipper. Now, the reason being is because whales are mammals. Whales evolved from land going creatures that were a bit like kind of small dogs. Now, they're quite, that's quite a cool bit of evolution because it meant that fish evolved into amphibians and into reptiles on the land, then evolved into mammals. Then at some point, those small mammals, dog-like creatures, thought, well, actually, there's lots of fish available in the sea. I'm going to change my environment. And they then re-evolved to go back into the oceans. But their front legs for swimming became more useful if they filled out with flesh, shortened, became wider and turned into the flippers of a whale. Whereas for us, the same kind of early rodent-like creatures, just before the dog-like creatures, they have front legs that ours evolved into grasping hands so that we could become arboreal, climbing in trees, that means, okay? But you can see by comparing the two, they're very, very similar. And if we open up a few more, look at a turtle type of reptile, but look at its front limb again the same bones, bones in the same place because we came from the same thing. A bird, same bones, same locations. A frog, same thing. Look how similar all of these are when you compare them and look at those structures. There's no way those could have evolved all that identically in totally different circumstances. We must have all come from a common ancestor. And even a horse, this is the one that quite often comes up in the GCSE specification. If you look at a horse's fall in there, it's still got the same bones. But what's interesting with a horse, to make it easier for running, what they've done, instead of the five fingers like we have there, all of these four on the outsides have kind of de-evolved and shriveled away and left just that middle digit, which I'll keep facing in this direction, 
that middle digit, which is what they run on. And if you think about a horse's hoof, it's just that nail. Your fingernail on that finger just evolved in a horse, evolved to move forward, cover the end, get much, much thicker. And that's what a horse is running on, the tip of that middle finger with their two front legs running like that, okay? But it's still the same evolutionary pathway. All of these creatures, we must have had a common ancestor that first evolved the pentadactyl limb, and then we all evolved slightly different versions of it as it spread out. Just one last one, this is a really cool one. This is a bat skeleton up above my head. Bats, also mammals, just look at its whole skeleton. So similar to ours, so similar to a human skeleton. Look at its rib cage, its pelvis. Its arms, it, you can see its humerus bone, you can see its very long radius and ulna, and then look, huge long fingers. So when a bat is flying, actually a lot of its movement is that, it's flapping its fingers to move its, its wings, okay? But very, very similar. You can't look at that and think that we evolved totally separately to a bat. So, so similar, there must be a common ancestor there. Even Darwin recognized this. I've shown you this diagram in the last presentation, but this was from one of Darwin's notebooks where he recognized, you can see where the one is, common ancestry that branched and changed. But if the pentadactyl limb evolved somewhere where that number one is, you can see that everything that came out, the ABCD, they would all share the pentadactyl limb, but evolved versions of it. Let's look at the next bit of evidence now. This is something called vestigial structures. Now, the word vestigial means sort of old left behind. So we know that vestigial structures are the result of genetic leftovers from an organism's evolutionary history. Now, if I should try and explain this to you with an analogy, if you've got a computer, when you're do, do writing an essay or you're developing something, as you go along, you save the new version and that overwrites the old version. So the old version disappears. Or if you save it as a new version, you'll probably go back and delete the old versions at one point. So they're gone, they don't exist anymore. You've just got that newest version. Evolution doesn't work like computers. Our DNA in our cells, as we evolve a new thing, the old genes will still be there. They might be inherited from different organisms, but we'd still retain the old genes. We keep getting a new version, the improved evolved version, but the old versions hang around. Now, the key thing when an organism is growing is knowing which genes to read and which ones to ignore. It's something called gene expression. Now, as humans, through evolutionary theory, we have evolved as mammals from reptiles, which came from amphibians, which came from fish, which came previously from that, from sort of primitive jellies, back from single cell eukaryotic cells, prokaryotes, and so on and so on. We still contain lots of DNA from all of those things that we evolved from, but we ignore it all. However, sometimes those vestigial structures come through and can be seen. So for example, if I pull up a whale here, so this is a blue whale, but this is true for most whale species, Whales, we've already just said in the previous slide, evolved from land mammals. But whales, if you look at this, they don't have back legs. However, if you dissected a whale and look in its back half, you'd find the vestigial remains, the leftover remains of a pelvis and of a humerus, of the legs. The leg bones in whales are still in there pointlessly. Now, why would they have evolved these pointless structures that don't do anything unless they're leftovers from when they used to have them. There's no reason why those should be in a whale unless they're leftovers from the previous things it evolved from. Exactly the same with snakes. The python species of snake, the biggest snakes, if you look, and I've given you a photo of the bones there, inside the back bit of uh, a snake, you can find the leftover little bone structures of their back legs from the lizards that they evolved from because they were snake they would have been the amphibians that dragged themselves onto land with legs that evolved into reptiles that then de-evolved their legs lost their legs because their legs were a hindrance actually when they were trying to get through narrow foliage um, if they wanted to develop a much longer body one option would have been to develop lots of legs to support the body all the way along or actually just ditch the legs altogether become more muscular so you could climb you could rear up you could crush things you know, legs were actually a disadvantage when you elongate your body massively. So they de-evolved them, but they're left over as vestigial structures. 
But even as humans, we have loads of vestigial structures and examples. Consider this, goosebumps. Goosebumps only form on humans when you get cold or when you get scared, adrenaline can cause them, because of tiny muscles under the skin called erector pili. Erector pili are little muscles that pull on all your hairs to try and pull them upright. Now that's pointless for us, but go and watch the homeostasis videos, especially one on thermoregulation, because the reason for these erector muscles is about regulating temperature, thermoregulation. Now that's useful if you're a creature that's covered in fur, like this cat. Because if a cat is cold on a cold day, those erector pili pull all their hairs upright, fluffing their hair up, trapping lots of air, and that air insulates them, it keeps them warm. That's pointless for us because we de-evolved our hair. Um, because we lived in hot places and we needed to regulate our temperatures better, we needed to lose heat as we run over long distances. So we de-evolved our hair, we lost hair that covered our body, but we have the vestigial remains of these erector pili that pointlessly give us goosebumps when we get cold to try and keep us warm. It's true in um, things with fur, it's also true in birds. So we know birds and mammals have common ancestry because they both do the same thing. Whenever you see birds like this dove all puffed up on a cold day, it's because the same erector pili are pulling their feathers out, feathers which are essentially modifications of hairs, um, pulls them out to fluff them up, to trap the air, to insulate them. So erector pili are leftover structures um, for us. Another one that can cause problems is the human appendix there. A little dangly bit of extra intestine that hangs off the start of the large intestine. It was useful back when we ate mainly um, leaves and grass and things with a lot of cellulose in there because it acted like a second stomach that food could go into, ferment and break down by all the bacteria that were housed in there to get more nutrition out of it. Since we moved away from a diet of leaves and grass and things like that when we evolved away from being one of the early types of ape, we didn't need it anymore. So it shriveled away, but it's still there and actually now can cause problems if it gets infected and you can get appendicitis. Recent evidence is showing actually that the appendix can house lots and lots of really beneficial bacteria to our development and that actually getting rid of it can be quite a negative thing. Um, but we certainly don't need it uh, as its old role in digestion of cellulose material. But it's still there. Why? Because it's a vestigial structure left over from our evolutionary ancestry. Now, just to leave you with a really weird thing before we move on, sometimes those genes, the vestigial structures that should be ignored, show up and create something that shouldn't be there. A bit of this leftover DNA gets red and we get things like this. That's a tail. That's a human with a tail. Now, this is rare, but it can happen that a baby is born where the coccyx, the coccyx is your tailbone, it's the bone at the end of your spine. I mean, even called a tailbone. We don't have tails, but we're evolved from things that do. If the coccyx, the coccyx should kind of be shut off when you're developing as a fetus inside your mother's, it should be shut off and said, don't, don't turn into a tail, we don't need one. But sometimes if that gene gets read wrongly, a tail forms in the baby. In this instance, the individual was 18 years old when they had the tail finally removed. Uh, and I think it was something like 15 or 16 centimetres long by that age. But they got it removed at that age. But sometimes these leftover genes from our ancestry do come into being, um, including things like fur, in which case if a child is born covered in fur, which does very occasionally happen, then their erector pili would still be useful and their hairs could stand on end when they were cold. But, you know, in our society, if someone was born covered in fur, we would think it was a bit odd. But it's just a leftover from our genetic ancestry. OK, next thing. So we've looked at anatomical comparison, comparing how things look and their bone structures and such. But we can now look a lot deeper on that and we can look at biochemical comparison. There's two main biochemical chemicals that allow comparison between species. We've got DNA, which has just appeared above me, and we've got proteins. The reason why these two are good for comparison is because they're formed in clear sequences. So we can look at the sequences and compare the differences. So if we look at one species here, and if that's a bit of DNA, T-A-G-A-T-T-C-G-C-A-C-T, 
If you remember back from the DNA structure lesson, these are the nucleotides. These are the bases on the nucleotides that form genetic code. These are the instructions for the amino acids. This is how they're written. So in this first organism, if that's their code, it could give them these proteins. And again, I'm just using the emojis to symbolize the different amino acids. OK, so those 12 nucleotides could give those four amino acids, because if you remember, you need three nucleotides to code for one amino acid. OK, now if we look at a second organism, they might have this code. So you'll notice a mutation, a change. We change the T to a G. Now, we wouldn't obviously change it. These could just be two organisms that we're looking at. We're comparing their DNA and going, oh, hang on, there's a difference here. In this gene, they're virtually identical, apart from there's one base difference. If there's one base different, they are slightly different, these two different creatures. If we looked at the proteins, we might find that these ones have one different amino acid. The, the hearts in the eyes emoji might change to the little devil horned one. OK, so now we're comparing their DNA and proteins. There's a different in both. We can say they're slightly different. If we looked at a third species, we might find that third species. We've swapped an A to a C. So now comparing species one and species three, they've got two differences between them. So they're quite different. And if you looked at their proteins, it might change another one of the amino acids. We might have changed the moustache one for the sunglasses one. So now we're seeing differences. We can compare how many differences. If we look at a fourth one, there's yet another change. So there's another difference. But on this one, that change in DNA might not cause a change in amino acids because not all mutations change the amino acid. So comparing proteins here wouldn't help. But we go back and compare the DNA and we do still see a difference. So one and four are clearly quite different. They've got three differences in their DNA. The red letters look a different. Now, change in DNA would be due to mutations. The more differences there are, the further apart two species have evolved from each other. So we know that one and four are really pretty far from each other, which means the common ancestor would be further back in time. Now, the logical way to interpret what's here is that one evolved into two, evolved into three and evolved into four. You can see the sequential differences. However, if we don't know the ages of these species, if we're collecting DNA from creatures, but we don't actually know how many millions of years those things have been on the planet, maybe it's not one, two, three, four. Maybe actually two was the original species and species two split into one and three because look from two there's only one difference going from two to three and one difference going from two to one so maybe the arrow over there is now the other way around two was the original that's where you pair this up with the fossil record to see well hang on how long ago was species two on the planet have we got any fossils have we got any remains can we put these in time sequence because then you can see the differences but again this all backs up that evidence for evolution and if you go back far enough everything on earth shares a common ancestry that's going back to the very first spark of life the very first primitive prokaryotic cells that we think were the very first forms of life on the planet and we all still house some of their original dna within us especially in our mitochondria which there's something called the endosymbiotic theory where our cells kind of absorbed bacteria which became our mitochondria to do our respiration for us but it's all about common ancestry and biochemical comparison is a really good way to try and show that. OK, this is the last slide, the last bit of evidence in that you can actually watch evolution happen. Whilst everything we've said so far is that evolution takes millions and millions of years, actually one evolutionary event can be very, very quick. You think back to the last video and how there's a mutant born that breeds more, increases in numbers, outcompetes the previous one. That can happen within a couple of generations. And if you've got creatures that have generations very quickly, if they breed every, you know, maybe in the case of bacteria and things like every 20 minutes or so for a generation, then evolution can be very, very fast and you can literally watch it happen. If we look at one example of this, following the peppered moth or Biston betularia, this is the peppered moth here. But there's two common forms found in the UK. This one, that's the peppered version or the non-melanic version. And you've got the melanic version. Melanic because it's melanin, which is the same pigment that makes skin browner. Um, so you've got the peppered version, you've got the melanic version. Now, during the day, the moths rest on tree trunks, which are covered in pale 
lichens. Lichens are organisms that grow on tree trunks. They tend to be very pale. So if you look at that picture there, you can see that non-melanic or that peppered version of the moth really, really well camouflaged. Well, during the day, that's great because if it's really well camouflaged, it's not going to get seen and eaten by the birds that prey on them. OK, but they're really well camouflaged, but the melanic ones aren't. OK, the melanic ones you can see because they're black against a pale background, they stand out. So they're going to get eaten by the birds. So not surprisingly, the melanic version was very rare. However, and this is where you can see evolution happen in the Industrial Revolution, the air quality caused lichens to die. Lichens are very, very susceptible uh, to poor air quality. It kills them. They're a really good indicator of healthy air. If you live somewhere where there's loads of lichens growing on the trees, you know your air is really quite clean. But of course, if the lichens die and the trees become covered with soot, like in this example, now look at what's happened. The melanic version is now well camouflaged and the peppered version isn't. So what do you think that's going to do to the ratio of them? Again, not surprisingly, the ratio of the two forms changed as a result of the environment and the selective pressure of uh, predators. It, during the Industrial Revolution, the numbers of the melanic moth greatly increased because now being melanic, was an adaptation, was an advantage under the selective pressure of predators. So their population increased. The peppered one went almost extinct, almost disappeared. But after time, they flipped back because the mutated versions with their different alleles switched from their advantages. And when the air quality cleared, the ratios flipped back because once the trees cleaned up and the lichens returned, suddenly the melanic ones, which had almost driven this one to extinction, outcompeted them. Suddenly, they were at a disadvantage again, they were at an advantage, so the population shifted back. Absolute pure evolution, change in selective pressures, flipping around the mutated different types, giving one an adaptation, one an advantage, the other not, the ratios change, one gets out competed. This is evolution in action. Okay. Now, one other terrifyingly observable example of this. Um, can be seen in antibiotic resistance. We won't talk about that now because it's uh, been covered in the disease section, but that's basically to link it into evolution. All we're talking about there is if you use antibiotics to kill bacteria, so you're now, your selective pressure is the bacteria that is the antibiotic that can kill them. Any that have got a mutation that mean they're not killed by the antibiotic, they're going to survive. So if you spray a whole surface with antibiotic, you'll kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria. But the 0.1% that are the mutants, that have that mutant allele, that means they can survive, they'll carry on. They'll multiply. They'll, they'll cover the surface again. Use that same antibiotic. It's not going to do anything now. You've selected by using antibiotic for a resistant form. You use a different one, then again, it'll kill most of them. But any with a mutation that can resist that second antibiotic, they'll survive, they'll proliferate, they'll cover the surface. So again, evolution in action, but now the selective pressure has been created by us accidentally or for, for a very good purpose. But when it's overused, we're actually selecting bacteria. We're pushing their evolution. So I'm hoping from seeing all that, there's very, very little doubt in your mind that evolution is a fact. Okay, Creatures have evolved over millions of years. Some of them made it and are still around. A lot of them went extinct. From here, I want you to complete your study of the evolution topic by going to evolution six on classification. This is now that we've said how many billions of different species have evolved on the planet and how much variation there is. We as humans like to put order onto that. So we have in invented systems to classify things, group them together. Uh, and this last video just looks at how we've done that. As always, please do subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Like this video if you found it useful and head over to my Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, there's a lot of useful and interesting little snippets of biology on there. Thank you.